In communities nationwide, even here at home, the call for equality and justice is being made loud and clear, prompting a push for police reform, promoting accountability and a stronger community bond, ending racial injustice, police brutality, and even death at the hands of those who take an oath to protect and serve. What are each of you hearing from those speaking out right now? Chief Crawl, we'll start with you. They want change and not just okay, something bad happened, we'll talk for a couple of weeks, we'll go our separate directions. This is not going to stop. And, and to be perfectly frank, I'm happy about that because everyone sitting here, everyone wearing a uniform has no problems with changing in the criminal justice system to make things more equitable, fair, and uh, transparent for everyone. What I'm hearing is we want justice. And justice from the perspective of being able to see and understand that people are really are people and that they should not be treated as anything less than uh, a human being. And that we have an opportunity, as the chief said, to really bring about change. And it's not just lip service, but it's really systemic change that can do what um, police say that they're supposed to do, which is to protect and serve? Well, I think uh, they want change. There's no question about that. They don't want a Band-Aid solution. Uh, they want to see real change. Uh, we've been through this before, but never like what I've seen in the last few weeks. Uh, there's an outcry across this country. There's an outcry in Toledo. There's an outcry in the city of Oregon. Uh, they want justice. I agree with uh, Mayor Hicks Hudson. They want justice and they want to see change and uh, they're serious and they're not going to settle for a Band-Aid solution. Uh, Chief DeVar, you're just wrapping up your term with the State Police Advisory Board where you addressed uh, recommendation standards for police departments across the state. In that position, did you find that these departments are willing and open for change or could these concerns be falling on deaf ears? No, to the contrary, uh, I've been very frustrated. Uh, I joined that task force in 2014, and uh, there were a lot of recommendations made. We traveled around the state. We heard from a lot of people. We heard some of the outcry then that we're hearing today, and there were a lot of sound recommendations. Uh, I spent a lot of time and a lot of effort. Those recommendations pretty much fell on deaf ears. There has been some progress made, but nowhere near what needs to be made to satisfy the community outrage that is going on right now in this, uh, in this country, in this state. Chief Kroll, uh, we've talked about change. Does it feel like this change may have, should have happened sooner than now? Oh, absolutely. Um, we, this is a real opportunity, not, not just for local law enforcement, not even for the state, for this country. This is an opportunity to show that we are progressive, that we're not stuck in the 60s and the 50s, that we understand that things are different now than they were generations ago. And it should, we should have been more proactive. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. And um, now uh, I think you're going to see a lot of movement at the national level, at the state level, and, and locally here. And it's a good thing. The governor moving ahead with some police reforms, some suggestions, proposing, uh, improving accountability, training, and transparency. Uh, also asking the legislature to approve banning of chokeholds unless uh, someone's life is threatening. Your thoughts about these proposals and how swiftly these can be implemented? Well, starting with the, the chokeholds, that's that's a no-brainer. There shouldn't be a police department in, in anywhere that says that's allowable unless it's a fatal force situation. We've never done it. I've been with TPD for 30 years. We've never been authorized to do it. We've never been trained in it. That, that's easy. Um, the other changes that he's making, like changing our certificate into a license that can be regulated, that can be suspended, fantastic idea. It, it's, it's great. Any more, any additional oversight that can make our profession more legitimate, I am 100% behind. And I was on a conference call with, with the governor and I'm assuming Chief Navarro was on that as well. And everything that he has proposed in AG Yost, it's spot on, it's timely, and it's just as important, it can be done very quickly. 
Representative Hicks Hudson, this training, this proposed training, it's not going to come free. Uh, these departments already cash strapped. Where is this permanent funding going to come from to ensure that this continues on? Well, I think just as we have uh, designated funding for Lake Erie for the for a 10 year period, we can also designate funding for this particular um, challenge that we have. And I know that in our caucus, the um, um, the Democratic caucus, we have been proposing these types of of changes and and solutions for a number of years. So really, what we're hearing is nothing really new. I do think that there may be a will to to implement them. So in terms of funding, you know, we're going to be going into the into January into a new budget cycle. So there will be dollars there. Also, right now we have, we're, we're maybe not in the best place financially because of COVID and the lack of, of income coming into the state, but that does not mean that we cannot be in, um, use our imaginations, our ingenuity to come up with those dollars because the licensing doesn't really require a lot of money. The um, implementation of some of the other changes don't require money, they just require folks to get up and do what they need to do. All right, Chief DeBar, speaking of funding, uh, there's been this call for defunding police. Is that even realistic? I echo the governor's comments last week when he said that that's absurd. There's a need for police reform. Defunding is not the answer. We need to see real, sensible police reform. I think it needs to be said that police officers have an incredibly dangerous job, and it's a very difficult job. And as a chief of police, we have a responsibility to provide them with the best training and the best equipment. And if we can't do that, then maybe we should rethink our existence as a police department. Uh, my tenure in Toledo and my tenure in Oregon, training is never tied to funding. Other states have found a way to provide and mandate 40 hours of in-service training for every police officer annually. Ohio needs to do the same. The governor is doing all the right things. I think he needs to be a little stronger on the subject of mandated training. It can't be tied to funding. If he does that, it's going to be a short-term solution, and we're going to fall right back into the same situation four years from now when the state can't find money to fund training. Training is the responsibility of a chief of police. I know you asked him that question. I have to jump in because I really believe that we need to stop using words that are not accurate. No one's talking about defunding police. What we're talking about is the reallocation of funds. So it will to enhance training to, to improve the delivery of services. When we talk about protecting and serving, that requires a different mindset. It requires different training, it requires different things, but when you hear that buzzword, the funding, the police, that's not what that means. It means reallocation of those dollars to ensure that while part of their job is critical, and it, not only critical, but dangerous, part of their job is to de-escalate, to, you know, to keep the peace. And that might require some different kinds of skills. So I just I know you wanted to do your whatever, but it's really important that we that I can't sit here and I won't sit here and allow words matter. And I won't allow that word to just be used and responded to without let's make being putting truth to it. Because the other part that we have to do as part of this change and for justice is really talk about and tell the truth about what's happening in our society within, you know, with what's just going on, so. Chief Navar, based off uh, your training, your uh, going across the state, how are departments supposed to deal with real reform when many of them answer to unions? Are the unions the blocking stone for real reform? I don't believe so. I think unions want due process and they should get due process. I haven't quite understood how these other cities and other states are able to terminate police officers the day after an incident happens. Uh, you can't do that in the state of Ohio. If you do that, you're, you're gonna have a problem down the road. Uh, we negotiate those contracts. Uh, as management, if there's something in that contract that we feel is inhibiting our ability to manage the department properly, every three years we have an opportunity to change that. Uh, 
I don't feel that uh, my tenure in Toledo, I was ever inhibited by the union contract to manage properly and, and, and require officers to do their job and hold them accountable. Chief Crawl Mayor Kapsikavich vowing to revive and strengthen the city's Civilian Police Review Committee, something all three of you all quite familiar with. Uh, however, one of the demands now giving them subpoena powers. Mm -hmm. Is this a good, bad idea? Well, this is an issue where you need to tap the brakes a little bit and talk about it. Civilian police review boards can be an advisory level down here and have hiring and firing power at the, at the other end of the spectrum. I think we need to find out what best practices are being done in other cities in the United States and then sit down with council and the administration and the police department and say what works here and enact that. This isn't something that gets introduced on a Tuesday and they vote for it the next Tuesday. I think this is something that if we're going to do it right and that's, that's really important to me, I, I'm all for it. I mean, look at the military. The military are governed and, and supervised by civilians. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be this way here. But this is something that we need to be informed and we need to make sure it's going to work here in Toledo. Representative Hicks Hudson, the state can pump money into training, but how can leaders, lawmakers, actually address what appears to be at the heart of the issue here, unconscious biases? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, in the House we have introduced uh, a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis. And that is an acknowledgement that the bedrock of so much of what's happening and why we're at this point in our, in our society is because we have not acknowledged the, what I call the original sin, which is slavery in the beginning of this country. And by once you identify what the issue is, then you can work to, to, um, to correct it. And by saying that we, you know, that this, that, you know, a, an African-American was three fifths of a person. And that, unfortunately, if we look at the history of policing in this country, it was designed to protect those property owners. And so we need to look at all that and bring that up to today. And when we do that, as leaders, if we can say, yes, we know that that's an issue, and as we, as we um, pr uh, produce more legislation with that lens, we can actually, I think, bring about what I talked about earlier, which is justice and acknowledge the problem and then also acknowledge ways to solve that problem. And it's up to us as leaders to do that. And unfortunately, my colleagues last Thursday night chose not to, to, to do something that was very simple, which was to uh, ban the Confederate flag at, at a, um, county fairs.